I don't enjoy mowing, but at the farm there's just so much to mow. What's a guy to do but build a GPS-driven autonomous lawnmower? I call it Automo, and I've been using it for over a year at the farm. It saved me tons of time, so let's see how it's built. A quick note before we dive in. You may be asking, why build this? Why not buy a commercially produced robot mower? The answer is in these videos you're seeing now. The area I'm mowing is large and long. Down the lane, around the orchard, around fields, etc. In other words, not a square yard. The cheaper robot mowers on the market require you to bury a wire around the area to be mowed, and then the mower just mows around in there. But with such long, narrow strips to be mowed at the farm, a boundary wire is untenable. GPS-driven commercial robot mowers cost $5,000 and up, and this whole build is less than $1,000. So let's see how it's built. We'll start with a quick overview, then move to detailed instructions. There are parts list and schematics in the, instruction, in the description below. There are four components to the auto mow. The first is the base station and autopilot. This is just a Windows laptop running Mission Planner. That's where the map is made. This is the autopilot. It's got a compass and a GPS, and it's what follows the map set at the base station. The second main component on the auto mow is the drivetrain. That consists of the electronic speed controller here. That gets commands from the autopilot telling it to turn the right or the left mower. And then a big car battery right here, which powers these electric bike motors right here. The third component on the auto mow is the frame itself. I just took some angle iron and welded this together. It's basically a cube with four wheel assemblies. The fourth and final component of the auto mow is the mower itself. This is just a standard push mower. Everything's been taken off of it and then it's been bolted to the frame of the rest of the auto mower. On to the detailed build. You can find the schematics and parts list in the description below and we'll reference it quite a bit. First is the wheel assembly. This is what the wheel assembly looks like up close. This is a half inch rod and this is a large washer that's been welded to that rod. Similarly, on the side we have the washer, a sprocket, and then an 18 inch utility tire. The way this is assembled is each washer is welded both to the rod and to the item that it's coupling to. You have the same situation here where this washer is welded to the rod and to the sprocket. The result is that when the wheel turns, the sprocket also turns and the axle turns as well. Here's a blown up color coded view of that wheel assembly. You can see that there's a washer in between each component and it's welded both to the rod and to the component next to it. The only exception is where you have those uh, roller bearings that are gonna fit into the pipe. Last up, this piece of metal pipe right here has a ball bearing inside here and inside here. That allows this rod to turn normally. This is actually welded to the frame. So this is the only piece that's actually connected to the frame. The rest of this can spin independently. There are four such wheel assemblies, all identical, with an exception on the back tires here. On the back tires, I added this. It's just a way to keep the chain in place. I had trouble on these back tires, especially when I got things like this, sticks stuck in there uh, as I was mowing, where the chain would slip off of these back tires. This was just a way for me to keep that chain in place. Next, let's examine the frame. This is three feet by two feet by 26 inches. The reason that's 26 inches is it just gives clearance around the body of the mower. This is a 21 inch mower and I wanted to have a little extra space. Every one of these pieces was taken from a, a, a bed frame. It's angle iron, steel, and it's welded at every one of the corners here. So it's a cube. You do want to make it as square as possible. Take diagonal measurements, you know, from here to here and up here to make sure that you've got this thing square. Again, here's a schematic of just that frame. It's a cube welded at all of the corners. There's the dimensions. And be sure that you keep these angles uh, 90 degrees. And then once you have it all welded together, you do have to take a notch out right here. And right here, you can see this, this uh, washer is just a little bit large. And it's actually going to need a notch right there so that it can pass normally. 
Um, so you gotta take those notches out at every one of the wheel assemblies and then weld those wheel assemblies into place. While you're doing that, be sure that you keep this line right here as straight as possible. So from your eventual motor connection down and forward, you want that to be in a line. Here's our schematic again, but with wheels added. Be sure you weld only the pipe to the frame and take out notches from the frame so that the axles can pass normally. The next system is the motor and the bike chain that drives it. This is probably the trickiest part to get just so. You want to make sure that you have this in a perfect line from the sprocket on the motor down to the tire and this sprocket back here. This chain is actually two standard bike chains. They've been fitted together. You'll have to use a bike chain tool uh, to pop out this pin right here, attach the new chain, pop the pin back in, and then get exactly the number of links that you need around here. I didn't add a tensioner, or at least not a dynamic tensioner. Instead, what I did is I inserted a piece of three-quarter plywood right here and then screwed the motor in place on there because that gave me pretty good tension. You can see it's not extremely tight, but fairly tight right here. Um, and then on the other side over here, just because it was built slightly differently, I was unable to get a three-quarter inch piece of plywood. I instead welded in a steel plate, drilled holes, and used some washers right here to get this thing just right and keep this, again, fairly tight. You can see that it moves, but not a whole lot. Um, Quick stop off to the schematic again. We've now got the forward direction of the mower and we've added the left and right motors. We'll refer to them by those names from here on out. Next comes the electronic speed controller and the car battery. You can see I welded together uh, out of some square tubing, just a little frame that would fit over the top here and also hold the battery in place. I can pick it up and take it out as needed to charge it. Over here, you have the positive and negative terminal of the battery plugged in. And here, you've got positive and negative, positive and negative of these motors. And they go directly to these motor assemblies right up here. Now I've connected up the terminals of the battery. You can actually ignore all of this and the autopilot over there for now. You can control this and test it out using these buttons right here. One of the nice things about this Citron board is that, that you can test it out. So if we give a push, there it goes. And if we push another one, now we move the other side. So you can take this thing for a little walk around, make sure that your chains are on with good tension and that you don't derail when you're driving this thing around, all before you put on the autopilot. Now for the last subsystem. We have our autopilot right here, our battery, the power supply for the autopilot, the GPS. This is an optional speaker right here, just so you know that it's come on. You actually don't need this cable at all. Uh, but I chose to put it on. And then this here are the signals that will control our electronic speed controller over there. You may wonder why are they so far apart and what's with this ethernet cable? Well, I discovered that this uh, compass is rather sensitive and the magnetic fields that are put out by these uh, motors are so large that will actually throw off the compass in here. So I had to physically separate those motors from this compass. And my solution was to run a, an ethernet cable along here and then plug it in over here. The reason for that is uh, you've actually got twisted copper pairs. You can see right here, these are twisted pairs uh, in an ethernet cable. And so I was able to take the grounds right here and uh, hook them into uh, using a twisted pair. One side of the twisted pair is ground and the other side is the signal. So these pulse width modulation signals are actually able to travel a much longer distance than they usually would and still arrive at our electronic speed controller in reasonably good shape. Uh, good enough that this thing will, that will behave properly. So when you look at the actual connections here, and this is also in the schematics attached, you have main out one and main out three. That's controlling the two motors. And then main out five and main out six. Uh, and that's controlling the direction of those uh, motors. So these two right here, um, they don't need to be in a twisted pair because it doesn't matter how quickly or slowly they go up or down. Well, you know, they, they can manage to go up and down and carry that signal all the way down. They're just direction, one or zero. But these pulse width modulation are rather fast on off signals. That's why we've got the ground also connected here. Inside here, uh, they're just soldered so that we have these wires connecting into these wires and then everything is wrapped up in this. 
Um, when you get all the way over to here, you want to make sure you know which ones are your pulse width modulation and which ones are your direction signals coming out of there. And then I took all of the grounds that uh, are coming in there and tied them together under the ground pins right here. Here's a better close-up view of that uh, cube orange pinout. And then when we switch over to the schematic, you can see a, sort of a top view of where you put the electronic speed controller, the car battery, and then all of the autopilot and components. One thing that wasn't in that video is the, the 900 megahertz transmitter. Uh, you can see that here on the electronic schematic. Uh, it does connect into Telem 1, and then you've got the rest of those connections shown here with red wires, and there's blue boxes around those Ethernet connections so that you make sure that you get your twisted pair uh, ground shielding on, on that twisted pair so that you can send those uh, pulse width modulation signals quite a bit further. Our 3S battery is going to power up our autopilot. The lights just came on on the GPS, and this speaker should start talking to us shortly. That's how you know you've got it turned on. You'll get lights flipper, flickering on here and eventually those lights will turn on green. Now let's actually dive into the settings of this cube orange for the rest of the setup of this video. Before you get too far into this, have a look at this page. It's getting started for Ardu Rover. It takes you through everything that you need to know to get this set up. In fact, you could ignore the rest of my video and just look at this. Um, but definitely familiarize yourself with these pages before we jump in. Once you are familiar, let's get started First install Mission Planner from the source, just Google it and install it on your Windows laptop. Then open it up, plug in a USB cable to your Cube Orange and choose to install firmware, the Ardu Rover firmware. Next disconnect the USB from your uh, Cube Orange, plug in your 900 megahertz USB to your laptop and assemble everything, plug everything into your Cube Orange. So that's the 900 megahertz radio, the power supply from the battery, uh, and the GPS, so everything should be hooked up. Now go into Mission Planner and click on the Connect button, and it's gonna try to connect. I've always had great success connecting with this setup. Um, it always works on the first try, but some people do have to go and configure things. If that's the case for you, by all means dive into the uh, help forums and such on ArduPilot, and people can help you get that connected. Now that you're wirelessly connected, let's set up some of the, the more difficult parameters. Switch over to Config, Full Parameter List, um, the first thing you're going to set is AHRS orientation to zero. And then the second thing here is arming check. Um, I've set it so that it only needs to have a compass and GPS lock before it will allow us to arm this thing. You may want to choose barometer, uh, board voltage, battery level as well. But the point here is there are things like RC channels that we don't have. We don't have a controller in our hands, so there's no remote control connection that way. So you're going to have to uncheck some of these pre-arm checks because we're running this completely off of our laptops. So go ahead and change those arming checks. Um, next, the board safety enables should be set to zero. That's so that we can uh, bring up the throttle on, uh, we can bring up the throttle, set it to auto mode, etc., without having a, a board safety enable switch. We don't physically have a switch that we want to switch on this thing. So the CAN D1, D2, and CAN P1, P2 settings all come straight from the HERE3 and Cube Orange integration page. That also goes for the GPS type and the NTF LED type. Uh, those are taken straight from this website. I'll flash it up here. And this is a great resource to learn about how to integrate our HERE 3 GPS and our Cube Orange. One more thing to note here is the uh, FS throttle enable is set to zero. That's so that we can enable our throttle uh, even when there's, you know, uh, in auto mode um, when we have no RC connection. And the last setting on this page, auto options should be zero. That allows us to put this into auto mode even when we don't have an RC connection and a few other things like that. Next up, we pop over to the setup and basic tuning tab. This is where we can set all of our basic parameters. Uh, the really important one here is the motor type that's brushed with relay, but the PID value uh, are also useful. Those are ways that you can control, you can tune how this thing is going to turn, how fast it's going to go, etc. Um, and then you can also do the same thing in the right-hand column where you've got the maximum speed and a few other uh, you know, parameters about turning radius, etc. So you can take a look at these and you can actually test yours out and see how it performs when you change these values. The next one's very simple. I'm not entirely sure this is even needed, but the flight modes I set to all auto. We only run this thing in auto mode, which basically means our laptop is uh, controlling it. We've already loaded a plan onto it and it should just run automatically. So I set all of these to auto. 
Next, there's a few calibration steps that you have to go through. The first is the acceleration calibration. You actually do have to set your mower, you know, facing upwards, sideways, etc., um, and click on each of these. That will calibrate your HERE 3 and your cube orange in those orientations. And it's important to do it with those motors on there because they do have their own magnetic field that will warp this. Next, for your compass calibration, you need to be sure that you move your UAV CAN uh, compass. That's the HERE 3 GPS to the top. I only use that compass, uh, the, the HERE 3 GPS. And then you're actually going to have to calibrate this thing. Um, if you're really strong, you can hit the start button and spin this thing around in 360 degrees in every orientation. So, you know, normal, upside down, side, etc. Uh, that's awfully difficult. I've found that you can actually get a good enough calibration by just clicking the large vehicle mag and pointing it directly north. And since you know where directly north is, uh, you'll get a good, a good enough compass calibration on this thing. Probably the most important setting is on this servo output tab. This is where you set throttle left and throttle right uh, for output one and three. That's main out one and three. Uh, this is what tells it to actually uh, drive like a R2D2 skid steer mower, which is exactly how you have it set up. And then the other important things are here, the min, max, and trim values. You can copy them straight off of here. What that's saying is what, what is the size of the pulse width that we should be sending at minimum throttle, maximum throttle, and trim, which means uh, idle. So don't move at all at idle in, in our case here. So you want to copy these values exactly, and you can actually test them out if you like. There's not much to say on the ESC calibration tab. All this says really is um, that we are brushed with relay. And now what that means is um, we've got a pulse width modulation that controls how much throttle we have. And then um, the, the relay part is uh, which direction should we go. So we're going to use auxiliary 5 and 6 to control the direction forwards or reverse for each of these. This tab is quite important. Uh, I live in an area with lots of agriculture, so we have a base station network. Um, and so I'm able to connect through the internet to that base station network. And the reason that the HERE 3 GPS was chosen is it can get base station corrections. Now, what does that really mean? A GPS is accurate to like, I don't know, 10 meters or something like that in a bad case. Um, we want it to be accurate to a few centimeters so that it can mow our lawn correctly. So it needs base station corrections. When it operates with those, it's called RTK mode. Uh, you can look that up. You can get RTK float or RTK fix. What you really want is RTK fix. Then you're within a couple centimeters of the absolute correct place. Um, in this tab right here, we can actually connect over the internet uh, using an NTRIP connection. So up in that NTRIP part, we clicked on connect. And then we fill in a, a string that allows us to connect to an HTTP server out there. And our, our what, when our GPS is receiving those base station corrections, it'll pass it back to this laptop right here. And then we can get base station corrections over the internet from that base station and pass them back out to our GPS. That way we know that our mower is actually where we want it to be. So here's what that string looks like. If you live in an agricultural area, get signed up for your local network. Here in Iowa, it's the Leica network. Uh, you may have something different. If you don't have any base stations in your area, you're going to have to buy the HERE 3 base. Uh, it's just another piece of equipment that you'd set up right next to your laptop, and then it would provide base station corrections. You have to go back to that uh, page that I flashed up earlier to sh see how to actually configure that. Um, but hopefully you live in an area with base station corrections like I do, and you can use them. If you have farmers in the fields, all their tractors and combines are getting base station corrections, so use those. The only other tab I'll mention, it's uh, of limited use but somewhat useful, is the motor test tab. Here you can actually turn on your uh, mo left and right motors and, and see them operate um, you know, for two seconds at 50% you know, capacity or something like that. Just to make sure your wireless connection is working and your uh, cube orange can actually talk to those motors. Now for the fun part, we actually get to plan out where we want this mower to go. So flip over to the planning tab of Mission Planner, and you're actually going to create something called a waypoints file. Now in reality, a waypoints file is just a text file with uh, GPS coordinates in it, and it says, you know, go to these waypoints. Um, ours is going to be a lot simpler than for something that flies. Uh, we don't have to worry about altitude, barometer settings, terrain, anything like that. We just are going to give this thing GPS coordinates, and it will drive to them. And when it gets to the, that one, it'll go to the next one in the file. 
So um, you can you can go to a satellite image of your property and just start clicking, and it will drop waypoints uh, all over the place. And then your mower will will once you load this onto the autopilot and hit go, uh, it'll go to those waypoints. But let's take a little bit closer look here at what one of these looks like. This is a satellite image of the lane at, at my farm. And so you can see that I had to drop the initial set of points all the way down the lane so that this thing would drive down the lane and mow it. Um, now, one cautionary tale here. Do not trust that you know where you click on here is really where it's going in reality. This satellite image is not perfect. So when you click a point, it won't necessarily go exactly there. So you got to have some trial and error. But the idea here is you're going to have a bunch of different points as you work your way down the, in my case, down the hill here, uh, where it's going to drive back and forth. And then I added in a little uh, grid section at the, at the bottom where it's going to mow back and forth just to clear a space at the bottom of the hill. So this is just a bunch of waypoints. Now, you may be thinking, oh, man, that's a lot of clicking. How do I do it regularly? Well, the answer is I didn't. I, I, I cheated. I mentioned that this is really just a text file. So what I did is I opened up an Excel spreadsheet or in LibreOffice spreadsheet, and then I exported it to a CSV file or a so let's take a look at what one of these looks like um, in Excel spreadsheet format. Column A is your waypoint number. Um, row two there where you've got a waypoint of zero is actually your home. It's not shown in Mission Planner, but that is where it would return to if it runs out of batteries. Um, and then you can just see, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Those are waypoint numbers. Uh, column I and J are your GPS coordinates. Now, this is reversed from what you may be thinking. Column I is actually the Y coordinate, so up, down. And column J is your X coordinate, uh, left, right. And you'll figure out what those are for, for you. Um, I actually had to put real coordinates in for waypoints 1 through 10. Um, and I, I had to test, verify that those actually got me to places where I wanted to be. And then after that, I just did math. So I, I told it, you know, move one uh, row to the left so that it will, you know, as it's going back up the hill, uh, it'll, it'll move one row to the left. And then I, I repeated all of the uh, Y coordinates. So here in column I, uh, you can see that um, row 11 and 12, uh, sorry, row 12 and 13, that's waypoint 10 and 11, they have the same coordinate, the same Y coordinate. And then as you look uh, at row 12 and row 9, those also have the same Y coordinate in column I there. So really what that means is I'm, I'm using formulas in my spreadsheet so that um, I will repeatedly hit the same Y coordinate. So as this thing uh, works its way down the lane and then it has to go back up, it'll be touching uh, the same Y coordinate each time it heads down the hill and then back up the hill. And in column J is where I'm going to set it a little bit to, well, in my case, to the left uh, or to the, to the west each time so that it will um, mow you know, one path to the, to the west each time that it goes back up. So here I'm highlighting, you can see that uh, in row 13 there, really all I'm doing is saying the, the Y coordinate equals uh, I12, which is the, 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 the um, cell above it. And then if we work our way down to cell 14, uh, row 14, that's waypoint 12, you can see that the value here is actually just stolen from I11, so uh, a couple rows up above. And it continues all the way down to uh, waypoint 20 there. I'm just stealing the Y coordinates. Um, now, in the uh, J column, that's, that's the uh, X coordinates, I did do actually a little bit of math. We'll jump over and look at that. I want to point out uh, where these are coming from, though. You see that in uh, row one of the spreadsheet in I and J, I actually added a couple values, 3 to the negative 6th uh, times 10 to the negative 6th and 2 times 10 to the negative 6th. I'm referencing that value. So here you can see J10 minus uh, J1. What I'm really doing there is I'm saying, OK, take the value that's up above there and then pop it to the left, to the west, by the value in J1. And that is, I, I, by trial and error, I discovered enough that the mower will move over almost its entire width. And so it, it'll uh, mow another track that's even all the way back up the lane uh, every one of those x coordinates is moved over just by two times ten to the negative sixth uh, GPS coordinates, which is you know approximately twenty inches or something like that. So that's that's exactly what you want it to be, so that you can get nice smooth paths up and down. And every now and then you lose your RTK, especially down if you're like in a really hilly area. And then you'll notice that you'll start to get mohawks uh, in between your rows, where this thing isn't able to get a really good GPS fix, and so it'll wander a bit. But um, generally speaking, this has worked out really well for me. And so you can see what I did here is I just made a repeated pattern. Uh, the first 
10 waypoints go down the lane. The second 10 waypoints work their way up the lane. The next 10 waypoints work their way back down the lane. And then I've got some yellow highlights there. That's that grid pattern back and forth. We'll take a look at that in just a moment. Um, but I, I really recommend doing something mathematical in a spreadsheet like this, and then uh, exporting this as a tab separated file or a C, uh, comma separated value file and naming it, you know, uh, mower dot waypoints you can load that dot waypoints text file into mission planner send it to your uh to your ardu pilot or you sorry your your cube orange and then and then tell it to execute the plan so it'll drive around and hit every one of those waypoints um, this is a much better way than actually trying to click everywhere that you want your mower to go you, you'll inevitably uh you know have some some gaps and this is easy to manipulate in spreadsheet form and then spit it out into a dot waypoints file and load it up in mission planner and tell it to go once it'll take you a little while to get this right especially because you have to empirically verify the first few points to make sure that it's going where you want but after you get that validated and then you just produce your grid here um, you you can rely on this you know every week that you want it to mow you just load the same file and hit go and and off it goes um, you a couple other points the the uh battery that you've got powering your your ardu uh, sorry your cube orange it's going to last a super long time because all it's doing is powering the cube orange but you will have to charge it i don't know every month or something and your car battery that's powering the wheels will run for 30 minutes and then need to be recharged so i actually have two car batteries one of them is always being charged that way i can just pop it in as soon as i'm done with the previous one um one other thing you don't have a rangefinder on this uh, which could do object avoidance if you want one you can put it on go watch the drone video that i have i've got you know explanations of how to set up range finders and stuff like that but you get, you want to make sure that this thing isn't going to hit any obstacles basically um and, and you know watch it the first couple times that it goes to make sure that it's not going to get into something that you don't want it to get into we didn't put any special object avoidance on here because I ran into problems doing that. Um, object avoidance failed miserably for me. Uh, I had tall grasses next to these paths. This is a very narrow lane and it's got tall grasses. And it would sometimes think that the tall grasses were an obstacle and try to go around them, which was not what I wanted it to do at all. Um, okay, so anyway, you can see that I'm working my way down here showing that these formulas uh, point to areas up above in, in the spreadsheet just to sort of flesh out you know, how all of these uh, formulas have been put into place. Um, and I recommend that you do something similar. There is a, an option within Mission Planner to create a grid, and if you have something like a square that you need mode, that would work great, but I don't have any areas like that. It's always going around a fenced uh, orchard or down a lane. You know, These are very narrow and not straight lines, so I had to do it this way where I get my first set of coordinates, make sure they're where, they're where I want, and then mathematically push it over, uh, you know, one row so that it'll um, mow right next to the area that it just mowed as it works its way, you know, back up this oddly shaped uh, thing. Okay, um, here we go, moving on to these yellow coordinates. I highlighted them yellow because it's the section um, where it, it makes a different pattern. It's at the bottom of the hill there. It's going to go left, right, left, right in a grid pattern, uh, or sorry, west, east, west, east, if you prefer. So you can see here the formula changes um, when we get to waypoint 31. It, it has the same uh, in column I there, uh, rows 33 and 34. You can see that the same Y value, but the X value, that is the east, west, changes. Um, and so then the, the next one down, uh, it's got row 35 36 have the same y coordinate um and then the x coordinates that is uh you know the, the the negative 91 values they repeat what was up there before so now we're basically repeating our um east west coordinate that is in column j and we are uh moving down the grid in the y coordinate so the yellow highlights correspond to this section at the bottom of the hill so you can see how you have to use a different formula for something like this and then as soon as it finishes with this it picks right back up uh, with the grid pattern that it was on previously and works its way all the way back up to the top of the lane and that's where it actually finishes I discovered that this takes about 30 minutes to run so the car battery is about depleted after this I swap in a new battery load my next waypoints file which is usually mowing around the orchard and you know tell it to go 
So that's how you create waypoints files. Be sure you spit them out into a tab separated formula, uh, load it into Mission Planner, and then you can actually write those to your cube orange. And um, then, as we'll take a look in just a minute, put it in auto mode and tell it to go. So here you are, you've tested everything, calibrated everything, and you've got your first waypoints file ready to go. You've loaded it onto your uh, mower, and what you need to do next is flip over to this data tab, click auto, and then arm. What that does is it puts the cube orange into auto mode. In other words, it'll run automatically. And then when you arm it, it's gonna start trying to execute whatever mission you have. Be sure you're ready to disable it or just yank the battery on the thing if you need to uh, and watch it like a hawk. Uh, you, this is a live mower running around. So um, until you're really comfortable that it's gonna do the right thing every time you hit go, be ready to turn this thing off or disarm it, whatever uh, makes the most sense. That's it. Be sure you uh, check out the bill of materials and the schematics in the description below. And uh, if you want to learn more about ArduPilot, which is an excellent platform, check out some of the other videos I created uh, about an autonomous sprayer drone or just go to the, uh, the forums. And Data says goodbye. Let me know what you think in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe for more unique and useful do-it-yourself builds.